All right, everybody, what a unique ceremony to witness there on Capitol Hill, that statue dedication. I will clip it on YouTube if you happen to miss it, and you can watch it again and again. Again, my name is Pilar Arias. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. I hope you are having a fabulous day. I've got some top stories ready to go for you from across the country. Just updated my lower third just like that. That's how quickly the News Now host can do things here on the stream. So, okay, let's start with this first top story about a state representative donating a kidney. The gift of life state representative Tiffany Mitchell says is one she's wanted to give for a long time. I just had this moment of if I was willing to do this for someone that I cared about so much, why would I also not be willing to do that for someone that I might not necessarily know myself? And now that dream is becoming a reality. In October, Representative Mitchell will undergo surgery, donating her kidney to someone who needs it in Pennsylvania. Her donation will end up impacting three lives because a family or friend who wasn't able to be a match for Mitchell's recipient is going to donate their organ to another person in need. And that process will happen once more with another family as well. I've had people ask me, like, you know, isn't that kind of risky that you're, you're donating an organ? That's a big risky thing. And I would say to them that we do a lot of risky things every day, including like, you know, just driving to the grocery store. And none of those risky things result in helping another person necessarily. According to Donate Life Northwest, which manages the registry for the state, there are hundreds in Oregon who are waiting for organ donations, and about 80% of them are kidney transplants. Mitchell says there are many reasons why people choose not to be living donors. A main factor, not enough sick leave. But she wants to change that by having living organ donors covered under the Family Medical Leave Act, which was just signed into law this year. If we can get more people to think that this is something that they could legitimately do, my hope is that that would actually help us eliminate that list. Helping people like Amy Adelman, who received two kidney donations after her body rejected the first one. You know, there are thousands of people waiting, um, and, you know, I was one of those people. It's a hard thing to go through, and but you do it because you want to have that life and you want to be able to, to do great things with your life. She says if one in every 10,000 people in the U.S. became a living donor, it could eliminate that wait list for kidney transplants. In Salem, Sarah Hurwitz, Fox 12 Oregon. All right, everybody, continuing on now with our top stories, we're going to head to Southern California, our neighbors just a little bit to the west. It's about five to a five and a half hour drive, depending on how quickly you go and which part of Southern California you go to, Los Angeles or San Diego. We all know President Trump is still spending some time in Southern California. We're supposed to be getting some uh, either tape playback or live footage of the president at the border wall border barrier there in Southern California, so we are kind of on standby for that. But this top story I have for you is about an autistic boy who wandered away from school and then ended up in handcuffs. I do believe that Bill Malugin has this next top story. I'm calling you out. Our children deserve better. Trevor Hibbert didn't mince his words to the Lancaster School District Board on Tuesday night. Thanks to following through with my threat to make you famous and every major news network in Los Angeles being involved now, you are. His anger stems from this incident on Monday. Son, son, <laughs> son, buddy, you got to calm down or you're going to be in the handcuffs until you do. But I don't care. That's when his 11-year-old severely autistic son Abraham was cuffed by deputies after he was found wandering a mile away from Endeavor Middle School where he had gotten into an altercation in class. As a father, it was my worst nightmare. And he says it's not the first time it happened. How is it that my special needs child, in the midst of a meltdown, when he's least in control of his faculties, is able to escape a secured campus, not the first time, not the second time, but the third time in as many weeks. Hibbert says he adopted Abraham at six months of age after he saw one of Fox 11 anchor Christine Devine's Wednesday's child adoption segments more than a decade ago. I saw a program on Fox. Wow. I don't watch the news. And I saw a program on Fox talking about Wednesday's child and how many children were aging out of the foster care system. Six months later, uh, we got Abraham. A six-month-old, did not know special needs child at the time, 
uh, baby number six of a 15-year methamphetamine addict. He has always been protective of Abraham and showed up to Tuesday night's Lancaster School Board meeting to criticize their handling of his son. God bless it, Michelle. I expected more from you. That was a direct message to Superintendent Michelle Bowers, who called the incident regrettable. We're doing everything that we need to do to support the family and to support this child in being successful in his new environment. So this is his first year in middle school. Um, and while we're co completely committed to his safety and his education, we're also uh, very mindful of the safety of our staff. So we're trying to balance all of that out. Regrettable? A 125-pound, 5-foot, 11-year-old special needs child that ends up in handcuffs because of your gross incompetence is not regrettable. That's abhorrent. Taking you out live now to Capitol Hill. Taking a look at our nation's capital, the U.S. Capitol in the capital of Washington, D.C. And that's because this next top story I have for you is about the gun control debate on Capitol Hill. Attorney General William Barr spending a second day on Capitol Hill meeting with key senators about possible gun control legislation. Democrats have been making a big push on the issue following mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton. And they claim there's now enough momentum to pass new laws strengthening background checks. The Senate leader McConnell hopes if we wait, if he waits us out, we'll just go away. Well, we're not going away. President Trump initially indicated he was prepared to support gun control measures, but he since backed off, blaming what he calls radical ideas from Democrats, including presidential contender Beto O'Rourke, who's proposed a mandatory gun buyback program. The president tweeting in part, quote, dummy Beto made it much harder to make a deal, convinced many that Dems just want to take your guns away. But Democrats say that's a distortion of their position. No gun will be taken away from someone who's a law-abiding citizen by this law. No, only people who shouldn't have guns will not get them. And who could disagree with that? Ultimately, any new legislation would have to win the approval of Senate Republicans who have been reluctant to act on the issue, most saying they're in no rush to pass new gun control laws. I'm okay with the president going slow and trying to find a package on gun legislation that will change behavior, that will produce results, not just a political pat on the back. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he'll wait for proposals from the White House before acting on gun control. In Washington, Doug McKelway, Fox News. All right, Doug, thanks so much for that update there from Capitol Hill. All right, so do any of you like, like the CSI shows? They stand for crime scene investigators, right? I believe so. I've never really been crazy into them, but I know a lot of people are. So this next top story is about what it's like to be a real-life forensic investigator. Regardless, any reporter, this would be a cool piece to put together. We see it on TV all the time, but what really goes into collecting evidence from a crime scene? Well, today we're giving you a look through the lens of a forensic investigator. I started watching those shows on TV like most people do. Many of the investigators at the Sacramento Police CSI unit fell in love with forensics through their television screens. But when they decided to pursue a career in the field, they realized how much time and energy goes into solving cases. Some days are busier than others. Like yesterday, I had maybe like seven calls that I went to. So you're just going call to call all around the city. And each of these forensic investigators has gone through months of training just to be able to step foot onto crime scenes. Once you get hired, it takes about six months of in-house training where we learn about fingerprints, um, CSI processing, so it could be anything from photographs, collecting evidence, using different kits that we have. These investigators comb through scenes using various tools to try to collect anything that could help police identify a suspect. Trying to identify someone that may have came in um, at a burglary or if we're trying to look for evidence, we'll take our alternative light source out there, uh, look for that type of biological evidence, or even just collecting obvious evidence that we've got on scene. They aren't sworn officers, but they work alongside law enforcement seeking justice for victims. I think the most rewarding is when I, I help a victim out, you know, if, if I can give them some sort of peace of mind of what kind of who did this to them or any sort of thing like that, um, I think the best part is just being able to help the community. And they want people to know their jobs are not as easy as it may look on TV. 
because TV, they only have so much time, um, they'll speed up the process. So something might take a half hour, when for us it takes like 10 hours. We do the best we can and <laughs> be patient with us. <laughs> In Sacramento, Olivia De Janeiro, Fox 40 News. Speaking of behind the scenes, what a cool report there, right everybody? Again, my name is Pilar Arias. Thank you so much for being here today. Got two more top stories ready to go for you. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to everyone who has served or is currently serving in our U.S. military. I try to bring up military-related news, veteran-related news as often as possible. And then this next top story I have for you is about the first woman in the Air Force to graduate from Ranger School. So let's get her story right now on News Now. I'm First Lieutenant Chelsea Hipsch. Right now I'm a flight commander. I'm one of 34 females to go through the Ranger course. Fortunately for me, I've had females go through it prior to me, knowing that they paved the way for, for me to have that opportunity. And as an airman to go through and being the first female, a really awesome opportunity to open the door for everyone else. The training I had to do was mostly on my own. It was a lot of ruck marches, a lot of running. I incorporated some swimming, going through the ranger handbook, studying a lot of the raids and patrols, ambushes. I earned a lot of respect while I was at training because, because of that. And some of them did talk to me afterwards and let me know that maybe they didn't have the same perspective on women in the military. And I hope that I am a good example for that. For them, even if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, they learn a little bit more about women in the military. Do you feel like a superhero? No. No. <laughs> Don't let anyone make you doubt yourself. See what you're made of because you won't know until you honestly give your full 100% everything you got for it. And I would say you, even if you go and you give it a shot, you might learn a lot about yourself. So take advantage of any opportunity that you have. And even if it's outside of Ranger School, don't think for a second that you might not be worthy of something. Go out and give it a shot. They're not gonna get rid of me for one, and for two, I'm gonna carry my weight. Oh, what a cool story. Again, thank you to all who have served or are currently serving. Huge appreciation for our U.S. military fighting for our rights and freedoms each and every day and sacrificing so much for the rest of us. All right, one more top story in this segment on News Now. It's about a masked man dousing a street in gasoline and then lighting it on fire. Let's find out what this is all about. Sirens in the morning may be shocking, but reality. It's crazy, crazy. May be harder to believe. You couldn't make this stuff up. You'd be surprised what you catch on video. After years as a firefighter, you'd think Captain Michael Pruitt had seen it all. An individual pours gasoline on the roadway, what's next? His firefighters arrived shortly after 7.30 this morning. Neighbors reporting there were flames in the road. <laughs> Surveillance cams snapping this pic. It looked like it was about a foot tall. And I was like, what? Came to the door and there you are, the street's on fire. A masked man had poured gasoline down two blocks, spanning Lyons, Arrington and Rybold. If there's anything else to to catch fire, it's gonna catch fire, it's gonna spread from that. Paula Turner's truck was just feet away. I'm waiting for it to catch the front of the truck on fire, and I was gonna stop it. While firefighters began smothering those flames elsewhere down the street. That individual returned to the scene about one block away. Frantically lighting another stretch of gasoline as firefighters chase after him. I don't understand why somebody would do that, it doesn't make sense. The suspect made it to his car, taking off before firefighters could stop him. Who would do that at 7 o'clock in the morning when school bus people? You can see him dumping gas as the bus stops ahead, that driver making the first call to firefighters. They were just a, a few seconds away once they received the call. Now they want their man. 